Welcome to the Show Up Dad podcast. This podcast is created for hardworking fathers. At the Show Up Dad, we recognize that fathers providing for their children is certainly important. But when women truly understand their unique role and gain the knowledge and skills to be great fathers, they can transform and impact future generations. Today's guest is Adam Lane Smith. He's been married for 14 years and has four children. Adam has worked for years as a licensed psychotherapist and now focus, focuses his specialty as an attachment specialist. Through his new role, Adam helps people build a new foundation for their life. Helping to fix attachment issues can transform your relationship in marriage, dating, work, friendship, and family. Welcome to the show, Adam. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited to be able to talk about attachment with you. Absolutely, brother. Well, my wife actually, she uh, was following you on Instagram and she's like, my TikTok. God. Or TikTok, TikTok, right? Mm-hmm. TikTok. And uh, she was just so enamored with all the great information you had. So I was like, man, we got to get that guy on here. So here you are. That Thanks was, for coming on. That was <laughs> that was fun that you popped up in the TikTok and said, hey, Adam, would you like to be? And I was like, yeah, that sounds fun. Send me an email. <laughs> so it's always fun. You never know what's going to happen on TikTok. It can go up or down. <laughs> right. It can. I just honestly was so excited to hear about how you articulate the different attachment styles in such a way that is easy to understand and apply to our lives. Um, I just knew that you would be a great guest for our audience. And so if you could start off by kind of discussing the different attachment styles, that would be great. Absolutely. So real quick for anyone who doesn't know, attachment is, it's this old theory that that nobody really discusses much anymore, but it is incredibly important. And we are bringing it back so that everyone can understand what it means. Mm -hmm. Attachment the easiest way to say it is this. It's it's the vehicle by which we give and receive love. It's our ability to connect to another human being securely and to give and receive love in that relationship, trusting that it will happen, that we deserve it, and that the other person will act in good faith. That is attachment. So there's, there's four different attachment styles we need to know about. And I'll do a brief rundown. It breaks down to two different camps. Either you have secure attachment or insecure attachment. And insecure attachment can break in three different ways. But secure attachment looks like this. It is your parents raising you with warmth and care and listening to you, cooperating with you, meeting your needs and explaining how you can meet the needs of other people in good faith. It is an open, mutually fulfilling family system, a self-correcting family system, where if one person has a problem, other people will go to them and check in with them. If there's an issue, people express it out loud and then work together as a team to cooperatively fix the issue with the expectation that everyone wants the family system to stay healthy and to work together. Now, you can see how this could obviously get very broken in our modern world, and it breaks in many different ways, three different ways. Um, You might be in uh, the NICU for the first three weeks of your life and your brain says, no one is holding me. I am cold. I am scared. I'm alone. I am. There's, there's no one around me meeting my needs. When I cry, something is wrong with Mm -hmm. me or the world. It might be daycare way too early. It could be abuse. It could be your parents are way too anxious to be able to calm down and give you the oxytocin bonding they need. There's all these different flags for attachment issues, but the core of it is this. A person can break into an anxious attachment style where they believe there is something wrong with them on the inside of them that everyone else can see, but they don't know what it is, but it makes them unlovable. It means everybody else, when they see that worthless thing about them, is going to realize you don't deserve to be in their presence and they will leave and go somewhere else. They don't want to meet your needs. They don't want to take care of you. They don't want to put up with your crap. You are not worth it. So you have to earn approval from everyone you meet, hoping desperately that you won't be abandoned. It's an endless craving to never be abandoned, but the belief that inevitably they are going to be abandoned. So they have to try to hedge their bets against the day they will be exposed as a fraud and lose everything by being, they have to be codependent. They have to take care of other people, meet these needs, find people who have huge problems and meet those needs for them and hope, hope, hope that someday when that person realizes they don't deserve to be loved, that person might not abandon them because they can't, because I fulfill all these needs for them. And, and it's this endless process of I can, I can only get my needs bent if I do 10 nice things for you and hope that you figure out that I have a need. And that's it. That's the anxious attachment style. Mm-hmm. It is obsessed with not being abandoned. They also have something called emotional impermanence. A, a baby, if, uh, here's my wedding ring. I do usually do this. If you have an, an item and a baby gets it covered up, the baby may forget that the ring is there. That's object impermanence. And then oh, the ring still exists. This is something babies have to learn is object permanence. Mm-hmm. When you have emotional, when you have anxious attachment issues, you have emotional impermanence. Of Someone says they love you and then they walk away 
And do they still really love you? No, it's probably gone. And it's, it's emotional mm. impermanence. They haven't texted me back in half an hour. They probably have realized I am worthless and they have to constantly get that check in and get reassurance that somebody still cares about them. Um, that's emotional impermanence. And that's, that's a feature of anxious attachment style. That's one way to break from yeah. attachment. Mm -hmm. The other way, the other way is avoidance of no one else on earth is capable of good faith. Mm. Everyone else, when the chips are down, will become selfish. It, when it really matters, they will, they will meet their own needs instead of mine. No one else is ever going to really help me. So I have to protect myself. And there's two different flavors. This comes in. There's the really just, I call it the nervous avoidant. Of I'm just, I'm scared of other people. I don't want to be around people. It's kind of like you've heard about bears. They're more scared of you than you are of them. They yeah. just stay away from people. They're usually high functioning, great jobs, no friends, no romantic partners, maybe some brief, you know, brief hookups or something, but very little. And they just can't be around people. Uh, but they don't hurt anybody. They don't hurt anybody. They're pretty nice people, actually. Just they're always afraid they're going to get hurt. So they kind of try to stay safe. Yeah. Then you slide down the spectrum toward more manipulative people. And there's what I call the manipulative avoidant over here on this side of other people are incapable of good faith. So I am going to take management of those people. I'm going to move them around. Even if I have to gaslight them, I have to lie to them. I got to hurt them sometimes, whatever I got to do. You slide down that spectrum. You attain more and more narcissistic traits off the scale on this side is narcissistic personality disorder, by the way. So when okay. you hear covert narcissist nowadays, it's actually a very manipulative avoidant person that doesn't qualify for a diagnosis, but they have these traits, these narcissistic mm. traits. And again, the belief is no one else on earth is capable of good faith. So it's either I am the problem or everyone else is the problem. Wow. Mm. And there is this very, and people at this point usually say, Adam, I kind of have both feelings sometimes. Yeah. Well, that's called disorganized style. That's a blend of the two. It's also been called anxious avoidance style. It's been called fearful avoidance style. But the disorganized style, you usually have one primary feature. You're either mostly anxious or mostly avoidant. Then you get into relationships and you tend to flip, especially during times when you're hypersensitive to other people's feelings and moods. And it feels like they're about to leave you or it feels like they're disrespecting you or it feels like they're cheating on you or it feels and you invent all these feelings. And then it becomes, you can't fire me because I quit. And you burn it down and you run out of the relationship. And then it turns out that there was nothing wrong in the first place. So then you have to try to earn your way back in by making the other person like you again and love by bombing them and being kind to them, all kinds of things, but it's hot and cold and hot and cold and chaotic and exhausting wow. for the person and for the people in their life. And these are the four attachment styles. And then they go forth out into the world and they try to relate to each other and the workplace and romance and dating pretty much everywhere. Wow. So what is the most common attachment style that you've seen? In the secure. world. Interestingly secure about the research, the best research we can find right now that has been done so far is about 50% of adult Americans seem to have secure attachment. Now it gets worse as you get to the younger and younger generations. They have more and more attachment issues. And then the research says of the three broken insecure types, avoidant is actually the most popular with 25, about 25%. And then 20% anxious and then about 5% disorganized type is what the research, the best research that they have out there right now. Wow. So what is contributing to more broken attachment styles in our youth? Well, you think you look back a hundred years ago, not to glamorize the past at all, but to you look back a hundred years ago and people had their core family, their nuclear family, then they had their expanded family, then they had the big family, then they had neighborhoods or villages, then they had a religious organization community usually around them. So they had five, five safety nets all around them. So if your parents didn't meet your needs, you have to be, you have to have these core beliefs disproven your extended family. When your aunts or uncles, your cousins step in, or your, your religious network steps in, or you have all these networks of people you can connect to, to undo the core belief, either that you are worthless because some people will come in and question and call that into question directly and then help you and love you, or that other people cannot act in good faith. And you call that and call that into question by going out and connecting with the bigger network and seeing that they actually are. And you had to, we are more and more isolated now. So we can insulate ourselves away from ever testing these wrong beliefs yeah. and the family systems and all those five networks have broken down. So then we don't have anyone coming in intimately and connecting with us and helping us in childhood to, to solve these problems either. So we have children growing up 
in completely broken family systems with none of the safety nets at all, the social safety nets around them. And then they live isolated, shut out lives where they just dive into escapism or little insular groups that don't actually connect and bond. They just connect around a hobby or mm -hmm. something like that. And they, they try to earn approval from other people and that's their whole life. They've never actually connected to anything that would have healed them at all. Yeah. I have a question for you, Adam. Now you've yeah. talked about isolation. What do you think contributes to that isolation? Like what are, what are, what are some of the major factors for this isolation that we're seeing now? Well, there's a number of things. Um, prior to a hundred years ago, for the entire human, human history, it was not common practice for you to travel even more than 15 or 20 miles from your home. Mm -hmm. And you certainly wouldn't live alone. And you certainly wouldn't have 10 different family members renting 10 different apartments and paying, paying 10 different sets of utilities and everybody being completely isolated alone, working these cubicle farm jobs from home, or just going to the office, checking your cubicle, go home. And we didn't have the levels of escapism quite that we have now. So we are able to build a somewhat functional life that looks nothing like what our biology is built for. It's the opposite of what our biology is built for. So if you look at, if you look at even 10,000 years ago, the Neolithic revolution, when we, when we learned that we can grow corn and we started building tiny little, you know, villages and settlements, a human being was not meant to be isolated. They, they lived with their tribe, safety in numbers. You didn't even have much privacy back then. It was survive together, protect each other, care for each other, solve problems together, all of that. And then we would collectively, at the end of the day, we would work together for pleasure and joy and all of those connected pieces. So if there was a problem, someone would see it and it was in the best interest of everybody to take care of each other. It's, it's not this magic utopia, but it was in the best interest of everybody to at least make sure everybody else was taken care of so that we could all continue to work and survive together. The human species now completely isolated, just mm -hmm. diving into solo pleasures and spends almost every minute of every day completely locked in their head alone without physical contact, without that intimacy, with no connectedness, no, no security of a tribe, no security of a village where people would protect you, no mutual protection, no mutual care, no mutual fulfillment. It's, it's worst case scenario for our brains now. Mm -hmm. Our brains think that we are the sole survivor of some catastrophe that wiped out everybody we should have known. And now we live in the, in the wilderness around strangers who don't accept us. And that's what our brains are really processing nowadays. We live among strangers who will not accept us. And that's unfortunately yeah. almost everybody now. Yeah. And you see a lot of people um, like from my age down, even the younger generation, they tend to isolate to try to work out a problem rather than going to their parents or going to their friends. I know with women, it's a lot more common to relate to each other. For men, men are very isolated in the sense that they don't get that same type of experience where they can go to other men to work out these problems, especially in younger, the younger generation. I think I see that they're really trying to work these things out on their own, in their own mind, but it just leads to problems. That's just, that's not the way that we are supposed to work. I have so many young men come into my coaching practice and they say, Adam, I have been trying to fix this problem for five years. And I say, have you talked to anybody about it? Well, no. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's not how that works. The male brain, it, it, the pathways, it goes back to observe and then forward to act upon the observation. See a problem, solve a problem. That's what the male brain is meant to do. But yes. the male brain is not born with every bit of data in the world. It's born with no data. And we have to learn and accrue data from watching other people, from learning from other people, from teachers, from experience. We have to learn all of this data, which helps us then solve problems we've never solved before that hopefully other people have solved. But if we isolate, then what happens is we go into it with our extremely limited data set to a problem we have never solved before. And we're trying to invent a solution to a problem all mm. over again. So every single man has to live as if no one has ever solved any problem ever before. And he must now resolve every problem a human can experience. And he's just sitting there stuck and stuck and stuck. And this is why most men become, it's like a learned helplessness. I'm helpless. There's nothing I can do. I'm powerless. I'm never going to figure this out. It's hopeless. I should just give up. Then suicide starts coming in. This is where um, so many men who come into my coaching are like on the edge of ending their life yes. because they're, they, they have, they, they, it's, it's hopeless. And if you believe you are worthless and can never open up to other people, or you'll be exposed as worthless and you'll be rejected, or you believe no one else on earth is capable of ever acting in good faith or would ever want to help you, 
then you feel it's worthless and pointless to even try to connect to somebody else to mm. get the information that would help you make that observation and then act upon it and solve your problem in your life. It's You stay stuck forever until you learn about attachment, connect to a couple people, open up about how miserable you are, find somebody who has solved the problem you're trying to solve, and mm. then just get the data from them. And then you plug it in and you start solving your problem. And all of a sudden life is better. Well, yeah, that's, that's how humans are meant to work. Yeah. Okay. No, for sure. Um, how big of a factor does shame play into that with men not wanting to open up? Well, if you cannot solve a problem, mm -hmm. then you feel worthless because that's what we are built to do. Our brains are built to be yeah. solution finding machines. Any woman who has ever tried to talk to us about her day and we keep throwing out solutions to every single thing that she says, <laughs> like, no, I don't want solutions. I just want to talk and share with you. Well, too bad. You're getting solutions. And we just, that, that's what we do. Our brain doesn't stop. Yeah. But that's that that if, for many of us, that's the purpose we feel that we bring. If you ask a man what is his life purpose, it's usually to help others solve problems or to solve a problem in the world or to empower other people to solve problems that they will encounter. It's some mm -hmm. some mixture of those things. And he'll say, I want to grow a big, healthy family who can solve problems together. You know, I want to build an organization that solves a problem. I want to help this number of people solve this problem. That's me right there, helping people solve their attachment. Um, men focus on solutions and that's our obsession and that's where we get so much of our value from so if a man is stuck there and says i can't solve this problem there and everybody else around me is fine and they're all happy i must be even more worthless than i thought i was before no man wants to admit he's weak or mm -hmm. helpless or powerless especially if his brain says i'm in a village of complete strangers and no one cares about me then weakness is like well then you're worthless get out of here go live in the weeds you're exiled the only thing holding him together in that group is that they allow him to live on the outskirts of the village because he's not completely worthless unless he opens up and shows that he is that's tremendous shame men men would rather die many times than ever yeah. open up many men go to their grave without ever opening up and having the conversation that could have saved their life wow that's wow deep, huh? i i this is all so big <laughs> so much information and it's so good i kind of want to back up a little bit because you give us this great scenario about being like a a child in the nicu for three weeks and how that instance can cause a break in the attachment and you can go one of three ways what contributes to the different ways in which you would go whether it would turn into like anxious attachment um or the avoidant or the disorganized are there certain factors that can create the different attachments when we're children mm -hmm. what i have mostly seen in my experience when i work because i've worked with hundreds if not thousands of clients at this point what i've mostly seen is that people with avoidance grew up in a family system where people were hurting each other and they could see people acting upon each other and say you people are messed up if they could see that break if they could see the hypocrisy if they could unravel those problems that those people were doing and see them hurting each other, then they turn their view outward and say, this was you. You guys clearly had something going on here. If a person twists it back around, or especially if a person had a very manipulative parent who really ground them into the dirt and convinced them over and over, you don't deserve love, really inconsistent love can do this. Um, giving them oxytocin, the bonding hormone oxytocin that's released mm -hmm. in the absence of stress. And a mother gives this to her child over and over and over. But then if she if she is manipulative or narcissistic or borderline personality disorder, something very that has potential for harm um, because of instability, then she will give inconsistent love and leave that child endlessly craving that to try to figure out how to get that approval and get that oxytocin back and get more of it if they can. Um mm -hmm. And usually they blame themselves that mom has withdrawn. So they chase for approval to try to get it back. And if they act well enough, they get it back. And they were like rewarded for on this en endless hamster wheel, earning approval, earning approval, earning approval. 
And then they will get in a relationship with someone who has avoidance and the avoidant person will love bomb them at the beginning and saturate them with oxytocin bonding, renewing that addiction cycle. And they will chase that avoidant person even into an abusive relationship and can't let it go because they're oxytocin basically addicted to that person. And they think this is the only drug dealer on earth who has the fix that I can't stop getting. So I have to chase this person for five years. Wow. Hmm. Wow. I definitely identify with a more anxious attachment type of style. Mm -hmm. So how do you start to heal this anxious attachment? Well, um, that is a good question. That is my specialty Mm -hmm. (laughs) that I retired from therapy because it became my specialty when I started learning about attachment theory and it answered so many questions for me. And I started asking other therapists about it. And none of them understood what attachment theory was. And I started connecting to the wider network through America, through Canada, even into Europe Mm -hmm. and asking, have you guys ever heard of attachment? And over and over and over, the answer I got was, isn't that that thing that in graduate school, they told us, don't worry about this because it's just for little kids and attachment doesn't matter for adults. Yes, that is what they tell in most graduate schools for for psychology, for, for therapists, for everybody. All we hear is there was this theory long time ago and it's called attachment theory but it doesn't really matter and if it's attachment in an adult it will always be a personality disorder so if it's not a personality disorder don't worry about it attachment doesn't matter that's what we're told Mm -hmm. and as i started my specialty out of dual specialty severe traumas especially childhood traumas and attachment and as i started working on it attachment was underlying all of the almost every diagnosis i saw in the book and that i worked with attachment was at the core And at least made them worse. Post-traumatic stress disorder, if you have attachment issues, lowers the threshold to then get PTSD after a traumatic event because your brain can't process the event with the right resiliency because you don't have a network or people who can help you. And your brain thinks this bad thing happened because of me or because no one else will ever help me. So attachment Mm -hmm. makes it easier to get PTSD, for example. Um, Generalized anxiety disorder, almost always connected to an attachment issue, but we don't treat the issues we just medicate the disorder and say, all right, here you go. Take these meds. You'll probably be all right. Talk to a therapist about how sad you feel. That's generally mm-hmm. the treatment for the stuff yeah. like that. Um, what we need, I'm simplifying, but they don't work on attachment. They don't even know it. So yeah. the way you fix attachment is, is a number of specific steps that I teach people. For example, Um, you have to diminish your anxiety response because as a child, your brain connects being abandoned or being rejected with death. Mm -hmm. So then later on in life, when it feels like you're going to be rejected by somebody, it feels like you're going to die. And you think, why am I reacting this way? I just need to be honest with so-and-so. But it's like this spike of terror, like existential level dread of I am going to die if I tell them I don't want to go to that restaurant today. That's the fear. It's it's like everything that could displease them is now life-threatening. So to fix this, number one, you got to diminish that anxiety response. And I have there's a number of mus- muscle techniques and things like that that I can teach people. Um, At that point, though, you often hate yourself. You Mm. don't love yourself. You don't respect yourself. And it's not true. The worst thing in the world that I hear makes me want to punch somebody right in the face when I hear it is you have to love yourself before other people can love you. And that is wrong. That is absolutely wrong. Mm. You, You cannot love yourself if you fundamentally believe either that you are unlovable or that other people are incapable of even being even loving you. Mm. If, if, if love is impossible, you cannot then love yourself. You can lie to yourself with positive affirmations over and over and feel like a liar even more. What you need to do is respect yourself. And that comes about by finding your core virtues and principles, your three core virtues and principles that define who you are, that you never want to violate, that you violate all the time to try to stay safe from other people Mm -hmm. that makes you dislike yourself and not respect yourself. You find those. Then you open up to a couple of other people in your life and say that, people you trust carefully and say, have the, I am an anxious person speech. You know, I'm an anxious person. You may not know this about me. You might, you probably do. They usually do already, but I'm anxious. I worry that people won't approve of me. I try to do and say things that make people like me, but I hate it. And it makes me feel lonely and I never want to do this again. So I'd love to have an honest relationship with you going forward. You know, here are my principles. Here's what I want to live by. Can we do this together? Mm -hmm. And almost every time they say yes, Uh, And almost every time they already knew that you were anxious, they just say, well, I didn't realize it was that bad. 
But as you receive the acceptance, you're, you're ripping open the part of yourself that said, I am worthless. No one will ever love me if they see this thing. And you expose that to see if it's really true. Can they really love you or not? Uh, or the ang the avoidant piece, you open up and say, is someone actually able to accept me or are they instantly going to turn on me and use this against me or reject me? And as you receive acceptance from the other person, whoosh, you get a rush of oxytocin, you get a rush of GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that comes about when you have oxytocin in your brain. You get serotonin, you get all these chemicals that rush through you and you feel finally like you were meant to feel. And as you open up and do this with a couple of people and then continue to test it in new circumstances, when you are scared, you are over overthinking, you open up and connect with these people and receive that acceptance again. You form cooperative relationships then where you express fears, express concerns, you get reassurance and you start that emotional impermanence of covering it up and then, oh wait, it's still there. That starts to go away as you prove over and over and over that it is still there. You desensitize your brain to the fear of the small bumps destroying your life, and you slowly gain confidence in the other people in your life. And the more that you do this, and the faster you dive into it, and the more conversations you have, the more you begin to heal. But the experience itself changes your brain chemistry and changes the way that you believe in love. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the most complex of the broken attachment styles seems to be the disorganized. Yes. How does somebody become, well, how, not become, but I guess, how do they end up having a broken attachment style that is more disorganized? Yeah, it um, it's a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. And almost every case I've ever seen was more severe pain be leading to a place where their brain says, okay, I'm going to start off with this attachment style to see if this will solve the pain I'm experiencing. Anxious or avoidant. And their caregivers or whoever was in their life, oftentimes they don't have mother and father. It's usually alternate caregivers. Mm -hmm. um, they continue to experience pain of some kind. And it could be abuse. It could be neglect. It could just be complete chaos and turbulence. And I've had 18 dads, you know, kind of stuff like that. Yeah. Um, just over and over and over hurt and hurt and hurt. And the brain says one attachment style is not enough to keep me safe. I can't just be earning, earning approval because that doesn't stop people from hurting me. And I can't just avoid them because they'll chase me down and hurt me anyway. So I need to build a blend of the two oh. that I can switch back and forth at will and be mobile and adaptive in my attachment and then be hypersensitive to the tiniest change in my environment to see who is going to feel what and what they're going to say and predict in advance what they're going to do. So I can then either run away or I can approval seek, or I can just get myself safe. And the extreme version of this is borderline personality disorder. That's the extreme outgrowth of this. Mm -hmm. But so many people with disorganized style are just walking around. They live functional lives. They, they work. Uh, they have really chaotic romantic relationships. They don't know why. And they hate it. They hate it themselves more than anybody else does. They're not monsters. They're just exhausted and they don't ever know how to relax into love because they can sabotage in one of both ways. And it may or not, may not even be based on reality or real threats. Oh, wow. Wow. How does that affect one's health? I mean, it, you say exhaustive. I mean, I, I can't even imagine all the different things yeah. that happen with your, your being. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, exhausted. when you're talking about that, that high level of, for example, cortisol running through your system all the time with any of these attachment issues, but especially with disorganized, you're looking at increased rates of cancer risk. Mm -hmm. You're looking at increased rates of autoimmune disorders. You're looking at migraines. You're looking at fibromyalgia. You're looking at addictions because mm -hmm. you don't have so, so much a time um, attachment lead, can lead into addictions of various types, because if you're down on oxytocin bonding, that, that, that warmth, that bonding, that nurturing, that safety, if you're down on that, then you won't release much GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that even allows you to not feel anxious or, or depressed. It inhibits those feelings and it allows you to sleep well at night. GABA does. Um, so you probably have chronic insomnia. That's another thing with, with major attachment issues. If you don't have good serotonin, your mood is going to be down. All kinds of problems are going to be there. And then vasopressin, another hormone we haven't even talked about, but that's bonding through solving challenges and stress together. If you don't believe that's possible, you often won't get it. If you're down on those four, then of the big five, all that's left is dopamine. So you're going to be endlessly chasing dopamine binges. So sugar and sugar addicts, people with diabetes, a lot of times what you'll experience, what you'll see is at the core of that, 
is endlessly binging on those substances to feel better and to make up for a deficit that's happening because of their attachment and has since they were a child. And you'll see families with weight issues often have attachment issues. And then they have drinking issues. They have gambling issues. They have video game addiction. They have porn addiction. They have all kinds of other addictions, the addictions that are just punching a dopamine button in the brain because that's all they have left wow. to, to live their life. So attachment issues lead to a number of mental, medical and substance related issues. Yeah. Big time. And I think it's interesting because you mentioned cortisol, but I don't think a lot of people understand that cortisol is actually the hormone that is placed in these medications that they give to patients that have had like an organ transplant or something, because it lowers the immune response in the body. So when you're constantly in a state of stress, your mm -hmm. body's constantly pumping cortisol. So your immune system is so low at that point that it's very difficult to mm -hmm. fight off any type of, you know, plaguing sickness that might be coming your way or even long-term chronic illnesses. Mm, absolutely. Cortisol, it, it, it also um, really shuts down the release of new oxytocin. So mm. if you haven't got much oxytocin in childhood and mm. you're flooded with cortisol all the time and you get into relationships hoping you'll feel better, it's really hard to relax into the bonding, into the connection, into the intimacy, into holding hands and just enjoying the moment. You're mm. just all the time stressed out, worried about how it's going to end badly. Yeah. Now our our whole foundation deals with a lot of blue collar workers, you know, linemen in particular, right? Now, these linemen all have one thing in common. They always work these long hours. They're constantly in different environments, whether it be cold from extreme heights to uh, just long hours, 24 hours straight, sometimes longer, 30, 36 hours, all these different contributing factors. You know, they're taking caffeine they're taking nicotine and stuff like that so there's a lot of peaks and valleys going through that so how does attachment play into all these different uh valleys that they have all these different things that are, that are like a uh, uh, plaguing that yeah i feel like some men seek out these type of yeah. professions because they feel that they function better in those uh -huh. more extreme professions and I don't know, maybe they need to heal their attachment style so that way they can have a more uh, fulfilling life mm. uh, and where they're see not seeking that stuff out. But what do you think about what he's saying about these difficult jobs, jobs that require so much of men to be in a state of stress all the time? And mm. we know by what we do, that they're not completely attaching to their children and their wives and things like that. So how can they help fix that in their lives? Mm. Well, number one, um, many men throw themselves into work to compensate for some avoidant attachment. They mm. will throw themselves into work because that's all they know how to give without knowing how to give the oxytocin. It, it, you don't have to have bad parents to have an attachment issue. You can just have parents that didn't know the right things to do mm -hmm. to help you feel safe and secured and bonded. So a lot of guys are walking around saying, I don't know why I'm so messed up. I had pretty good parents. I just, I can never connect to my kids. It's because your parents didn't teach you how. So then you may seek out exam places where you can get away from your family. Plenty of pilots, plenty of military men, plenty of first mm -hmm. responders who work those, those, those horrible hours that are just, they run you down. Yeah. Many of them throw themselves into that because it is an escape from the pressures of intimacy, from the pressures of not knowing what to do in the home, from the shame of not knowing what to do in the home, or even just feeling like overwhelmed and smothered by the needs in the home that can happen. And yeah. then many of them feel that guilt and shame because they're working their hours and, and they don't know how to build that connection. So they throw themselves into, like you said, all the substances to manage the cortisol. Then it's hard to just unplug that and, un and turn it off when you come home. Even if you have good attachment, really hard to just flick a switch, come home and be super dad all as soon as you walk in the door when you've just put in 12 or 14 hours, you know, working a line, doing a hard work like that and stress thrumming through your veins. And all that's kept you there was a, was a cigarette at the end of the shift. Then you come home and you got to play with your kids who just want to hang on your neck all day and, and scream in your ear. And it's hard. It's very hard. You need to learn about attachment to see if it's driving you into compulsive behaviors that are destroying you. Mm -hmm. And you need to learn about attachment so that you can provide it correctly for your children on both sides. You need to be doing both. Even if your attachment's great, 
make sure you're giving your kids what they actually need so that they can get those needs met. I think it's interesting. This kind of moves us into a, a different topic, but you talk about vasopressin bonding with mm-hmm. men. And mm-hmm. I would love it if you could kind of talk a little bit about that and why that's so important for men and how they can bond with their spouses. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if it applies also to children, but um, I would love to hear more about this topic. Yeah. So it, um, that's the bonding hormone that was released in the brain for all humans, but especially men, men have more receptors for it. When we overcome stress or challenges or achieve a mission or achieve a goal together, anything where you can high five at the end and say, we did this together. That's when that releases. And there's a couple of key elements there. You need to have secure attachments so that you can say, we did this together instead of you did this, I'm worthless, or I did this and I just had to manage you around the obstacles like a tool. If you can say, we did this together in good faith, that's when the, that's when you release that vasopressin. And in children, especially boys, this is crucial. Father's teaching releases this. You achieve a goal, you grow together in a skill, or you see your son grow together in a skill. And solving challenges together. Dads and sons used to do Pinewood Derby races and things yeah. like that. Uh, wrestling and playing together, um, going out and facing challenges, achieving things, anything where achievements can be marked. And you can high five and say, we did this together. That's where you've asked the press and release. And if you don't do that, your brain says, I don't have anyone I can count on during a crisis. I am alone. It's absolutely vital. In Iceland, they have a saying, bear is the back of a brotherless man. And if you don't have those vasopressin bonds, your brain says, I am naked on my back and I'm going to get stabbed. In a crisis, no one's going to have my back. I'm going to be completely alone. And then it kicks up cortisol even worse because it says, when I get in a crisis, bunker down. We talked about this earlier. Bunker down, solve the problem alone or die. And that's what the brain says, because it hasn't formed those bonds with other people that mm-hmm. would have allowed you to say, hey, a crisis is happening. I should turn to that person. And in a, in a marriage, for example, it's yeah. crucial that you have this bond for when you hit a crisis or any kind of stress. For example, having a first child. Many couples experience an affair after as they have their first child. She's pregnant or has just given birth and they experience an affair within the first six months. Very common as they go through that stress of the entire first year of experience of them turning away from each other or him turning away to try to just solve his stress. And he looked, there's someone else right here to help me feel better. Very common for that kind of thing to happen. So absolutely important that you have that bond. I think it's interesting that you're saying in the beginning of talking about vasopressin bonding, that if your attachment isn't healed, you necessarily can't tap into, you really can't tap into that. Is that what I'm hearing correctly? Very much harder, very much harder to do it. So if I'm like an anxious attachment and if David's an avoidant attachment, it would be very difficult for us to experience that type of bonding. It could be if you guys are not able to link it up in your brain and say, okay, regardless of my internal feelings, we did this as a team. And that itself, as couples do that, that can begin healing the, the attachment process right there because you'll start forming that connection and saying, okay, someone else did work in good faith with me. And I actually have some worth in this relationship. So you can actually bond by building this hormone together as well. And I see that too. It's interesting you said that because I mean, our our children see everything, right? They watch Mm -hmm. everything we do. So I remember this one incident where me and my wife, we had had this project and we had accomplished it together working as a team and we high-fived each other, right? Mm -hmm. My daughter saw that. She was like 13 at the time, right? Remember that? Which project was it? It was, uh, we, we had, I don't know, we accomplished uh, uh, cleaning out our garage and taking some stuff to to uh, to give it to Goodwill and stuff like that, right? And one of the bins was locked and they couldn't get in there and I figured it out and we both worked together to get it into the bin, right? And uh, we high-fived, we're like, oh, high-five. And we just high-fived real quick or whatever. And our daughter saw that and she had this great big smile on her face. And what did she ask you? Remember that? I don't remember. You don't remember I'm that? I'm so sorry. When... <laughs> Well, anyhow, I remember it. <laughs> anyhow, we high fived each other, and Nakota was just so ecstatic. She's like, "Oh, why did you guys high five? And we're like, "Oh, because we accomplished something." And she's like, "That is really cool." Yeah, you know. And I think she that always is- feels very secure when we're doing things as a family. I can mm-hmm. tell the difference in our children. Like yesterday was Christmas, and we 
cooked the entire Christmas dinner all together. Like each kid had a job and mm -hmm. everybody was just thriving the rest of the day. They just felt so in tune and so together. Is that an example of vasopressin bonding or yes. that yes, is, it is okay? Even cooking a big meal like that together, doing a jigsaw puzzle, repairing a, a car engine or repairing an old antique, restoring something, doing yeah. home repairs, anything where you have achieved a mission at the end as a team. Absolutely. Yes, it is. Wow. Is that a part of the the healthy dynamic to develop secure attachments? Can we kind of start healing our children? Like say, for instance, they started off as an anxious attachment, but through life as we build, Evil. put more of those building blocks in place, can we change that into a secure attachment for our children yes. for the future? Yes, you can, you can, that's, that's my work is helping people build secure attachment from insecure attachment. And that is something parents can do. Now it is not just giving them those experiences of bonding though, because again, their, yeah. their attachment can block those things. So it is that paired with having open discussions about attachment and about bonding, about love and about the expectations and the relationship and about how they get their needs met and about what other people want from them and about what they can do and what the lines are and all of that completely on the table, being totally open and building real emotional intimacy with your kids. That's absolutely crucial that it all be transparent and spoken and explicit. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, if you're just trying to push the buttons, very often, that's the mistake a lot of parents make when they hear about attachment. They start trying to push the right buttons without having the conversations. And the other people freak out and say, why are you changing? It's scaring me even more. And they back off and it makes you feel bad. And then you feel like they don't want to bond with you. And then you back off and then they worry about what you just did and why. And all they saw you act, act, act kind of weird and different and then mm -hmm. get even colder. And it just hurts it. Having the explicit conversations, mm -hmm. it should be paired with doing the more bonding. Absolutely. Both. And I seen that actually with my daughter when I'd go on these drives and, you know, I, on our whole mission for me to change, to become a better father and stuff like that. She wasn't accepting of it at all, you know, and it's because like you said, I hadn't gone into there, been vulnerable, uh, been open to her and explained to her that daddy's going through some stuff. I realized I made mistakes and I want to change that. You know, I didn't do that. I just started doing these changes and she was like, who is this guy? She completely didn't trust me at all it, it was it was awful and then like you said i was getting angry because i felt that 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 touched something inside of me where i was feeling like i was not good enough for her even though i was making these changes you know what i mean so that led me to being angry at her as well so it was a process so you're absolutely right when you say you got to be open with them and get it on the table and let them know because that's the key to the relationship i have with her now and that is the key to overcoming. If you had avoidant attachment, mm -hmm. that's the key to overcoming. That is cracking open and sharing in good faith, what you need and seeing if the other person will respond in, in similar good faith or not, if they use it against you, that's a lot of dads with avoidance, even mild avoidance. They say, well, I think I'm just going to learn these things and just try to use them on my wife and kids. Mm -hmm. And it goes horribly bad because of that reason. But when he opens up and says, okay, guys, I got to explain this to you. Here's what I'm learning. Here's what I would like. Can we do this together? Mm -hmm. Usually the teens are a little standoffish at first. If you prove yeah. it to them over a few weeks or a month, they do better. Little kids eat it up and wives usually wait until you have fixed your relationship with your kids. And then they start trusting you more and building the relationship. You can't fill Can't fix a relationship with your wife before you fix it with your kids. It just doesn't work that way. It's got to go kids first. <laughs> yeah, I, you've experienced that <laughs> i definitely can see how that would really be important to the wife because the wife cares so much for the kids and she feels that they're so important and if if a husband can't be kind and loving and want to change enough for their own flesh and blood then they're like well i can't trust you type of thing i feel that's from and my he's, perspective. Absolutely. I wrote a whole book on this called Exhausted Wives, Bewildered Husbands, where they're in a marriage for 10, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And she has bonded to the kids and she got oxytocin for the first time through the kids, but also wants the kids to have good attachment, but doesn't know what attachment is. She just generally knows that they're, they're anxious and nervous and something about dad is not meeting their deepest needs. And it slowly becomes dad is more and more the enemy. And is the problem that the kids are unhappy about 
And it's, you can't build emotional intimacy when she thinks that you are harming the children through your very existence. You have to become a positive existence that is helping the children and growing their bonds and giving them good attachment. And then she will crave to bond with you at that point, because now you're helping her children that she loves so much. It's, it's, it's not just, there's no neutral ground. No. You're, either, you're either good or not. Yeah, you're either, the, you're either an ally or an enemy, and you don't want to be in the enemy camp because she won't bond with you at that point. No, you're absolutely right. Because I remember feeling like I was the enemy with my whole entire family when I'd come back from being out of town, and uh, I'd even tell my wife, I'd be like, "Look, I'm not your enemy." You remember that? Yeah, and it's funny because I I have like the anxious attachment style. Mm-hmm. And he's more avoidant. So he would leave. And then, you know, like you said, my fear was abandonment, Mm -hmm. but his job required him to leave and he would work Mm -hmm. out of town for these long periods of time. And it just would crush me. But, you know, it was like what you're saying. I couldn't see the love because it wasn't right in front of my face. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also, it was difficult to accept any changes as well because the attachment style hasn't been fixed yet and for him Mm -hmm. the same is true Mm -hmm. um i i'm curious how does a child end up with a deprivation of oxytocin in from their family like what causes the deprivation simplest very simplest is not enough hugging not enough reassurance not Mm -hmm. enough quality time together not enough like story time at nighttime not enough kisses not enough you know i love yous and care and nurturing but then high levels of cortisol, which would stop oxytocin from producing even with smaller examples um, or smaller activity. So high cortisol coupled with not knowing how to release the oxytocin in the first place. So mm. it's it's a very detached sort of parenting style that is more fact and, uh, and logic-based. And you do this, do this, now do this, now go over there, now go over there. Okay, you're a good kid. Thanks. See you tomorrow. It's much more like that versus the warmth and the nurturing and the reassurance. Mm. Oh, so it's structure without the relationship. Without the relationship. Exactly. Very much so. The relationship oh. is what releases the oxytocin. Okay. And so the the oxytocin deprivation most likely pushes children into the anxious attachment style or is that, can it go either way? It can, it seems to go either way. It's, it's still, it's something I'm still teasing out is exactly what will cause someone to split from anxious or avoidant. It's still, it's, it might be a personality thing because we're born with about half of our personality intact Mm. and it could be environmental of watching other people attack each other, but not, not having warmth and care definitely leaves you craving it, especially if you get a taste of some of it Mm -hmm. and then it's taken away and you don't understand why. That seems to be a big piece. Inconsistent oxytocin is really big for anxious attachment. Mm. Now you touch base on watching people attacking each other. And I want to mm. share with you something. Okay. And I, we talked about this on the podcast and previous deals, but I, it always blows my mind. When we first moved from New Mexico to Southern California, my daughter, she went to a bigger school, stuff like that. Right. And she came home one day and she had already talked to us about having a lot of friends and stuff. Right. Well, she came home one day and I thought everything was going good with her. So I asked her how her day was and uh, she was feeling really down and she opened up to me. She's like, oh, dad, I don't feel like I fit in. So I started going through the proverbial questions that a dad asked, you know, why do you feel like you don't fit in, blah, blah, blah. Right. Well, her answer to me was, dad, I feel like I don't fit in because people are not fighting. People are not talking about who got jumped this weekend. And it blew my mind that that was the environment she used to be in, right? Because when you're in it, you don't even recognize it. You know, you just think that's that's something common, okay? Mm-hmm. But once mm-hmm. you get out of that environment, right, then you start seeing that stuff's not right. And that's what I recognize with her. So I have to stop her at that instance and be like, okay, honey, I'm glad you brought this up. That's the reason why we moved. That's one of the reasons why we moved. Because that environment was bad. And then she had to stop and think about it. She paused and she's like, yeah, you're right, dad. That is not yep. acceptable. That's you not. Have to make it, you have to make it explicit yeah. and then process it through together. And then it will take time and it will change how the brain works. That th- that what you just did there, mm-hmm. do that everywhere. On every topic, on every concern, every time someone's overthinking, every time someone is scared, every time someone is distant, that explicit cooperation. You cooperated inside of a conflict mm-hmm. to solve a problem. When we cooperate, 
we heal attachment. Attachment wow. makes it impossible to cooperate. So the more we cooperate, the healthier we get. Wow. wow. It, it There is a reason why solitary confinement is one of the worst punishments we can give to man. It completely mm -hmm. removes us from the experience of attachment. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, people don't realize how important this topic is. And that's why I was so excited to have you on, because I really do feel that it affects all of us in yeah. every way and it affects everything in our life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It does. It, it touches every part of your life and every type of relationship, not just romance, not just family. What are some questions that people can ask themselves to kind of figure out where they stand, where they lie on the attachment spectrum? Sure. Um, do I believe other people can act unselfishly? Do I believe other people will act in good faith? Mm. Do I believe other people care about mutual fulfillment instead of just self-fulfillment? That's a, Those are good three questions to get people started for avoidance. Okay. And then on the anxious side, do I believe that I am lovable? Do I believe people can accept me with my baggage? Do I believe that I have worth in relationships beyond what I do for people? Those are three good questions to ask on the anxious side. And all six of those are good questions to ask on the disorganized side. <laughs> and if you can say of all of those, you're like, yes, yes, yes. I feel then you probably have more secure attachment than you think. Mm. Wow. I wanted to ask you, Adam, um, on one of the questions, I think it was the avoidant attachment mm -hmm. style, right? Mm -hmm. I think that you said that that was one where you saw people hating each other. Right now, does that have to deal with like violence, like being uh, like young and seeing a lot of violence? Is that it can, it definitely can. That can prime you. Uh, uh -huh. Cause I worked as a licensed psychotherapist. I worked in corrections okay. for quite a long time and with correction yeah. cases. And many of those men are very avoidant because mm -hmm. they truly don't believe anyone else ever will act in good faith because everything they've seen has been, no, people are going to stab you for whatever they can get. People are going to yeah. steal from you. People will rob each other. That's how people are able to do those things mm -hmm. is they become so massively avoidant that it becomes, it takes over their whole personality mm -hmm. and you develop a personality disorder. So extreme avoidance, extreme avoidant personality disorder is called antisocial personality disorder, which yeah. is the criminal, the criminal aspect and the criminal personality disorder it all stems from avoidance more and more and more and more as you attach more and more as you get more and more attachment wounds mm -hmm. as you go so yes it, it seeing violence but also just seeing how people mistreat each other seeing yeah. people rob each other scream at each other put each other down hurt each other just just treat each other like garbage and they recognize that it is not themselves if they can if they can make that recognition that it's not me it's something with other people it clicks over into avoidance. Hmm. Wow. 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 Yeah. Cause I see that even with myself, I was a victim of a violent crime when I was like 14 years old, I got stuck mm -hmm. with a 21 year old man. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw from that point on where everything changed in my life, but, you know, I had plans of doing all different kinds of stuff and it just changed. I went to the military because I needed to feel like I needed to fit in. I needed to feel like I, I could protect myself, all these different things, you know what I mean? And it, it totally changed my whole outlook on life perspective on life and trajectory in life you know so i, I find that very interesting hmm. yeah. that's how it works i also um so if if a child has a good attachment style with their parent but is witnessing a destructive attachment between the two parents mm -hmm. can that affect a child's attachment style because i know that children we all have mirror neurons so Whatever we see, we absorb and it, it comes into our brain and it changes our brain and it changes our, our personality. So even though they might have a healthy attachment style with their both parents, is it possible just witnessing something that's not right be in a marriage to still affect a child? To that, I would say um, it is very difficult for two parents to give totally secure attachment to a child in a vacuum, mm. but then have massive marital disruption between the two of them, like real marital disruption because secure attachment, two people with secure attachment. It's not that they'll never argue. 
but it's that they will work together to figure out a way to cooperate and solve a problem. I was a licensed marriage and family therapist for years and I, and I still coach couples on, on things like this. And it's, I have never seen a separation or divorce or cases of abuse or just extreme fighting that didn't stem from one of them, at least having an attachment issue. It's always attachment at the base because when you solve the attachment and you truly believe you can cooperate to solve problems in good faith sure. and that that's the best way to solve problems, it becomes not, I don't say easy, but almost easy to just live your life and work as a marriage. There is always some factor there that you need to fix. So could a child theoretically have amazing connection with, with each parent, but then see that discord between them and have that be an issue? I would say yes. Because here's where here's where it happens is as they see the people they love the most and rely on fighting and tearing apart the family system in some way, that creates tons of cortisol and insecurity. And yeah. it's going to be really hard for them to get the oxytocin bonding and relax into it the way that they should because they have an existential level threat affecting their home life and their family life. So yeah, even if even perfect case scenario, it really does need to at least be cooperation between the parents even if it's not oh even if they're divorced and they're co-parenting you can still at least build a cooperative respectful amicable relationship that the child at least can see you guys treat each other well at mutual fulfillment and good faith mm -hmm. absolutely that's more important right so it's not like an isolated incident if you have an attachment disorder, it's going to be viral in your life. It's going to touch Typical. everything. So Typical. it won't yeah. just touch your spouse. It'll touch your children too. So absolutely. Right. Okay. Avoidant and avoidant and anxious both. Mm -hmm. So good reason oh. to fix it. Hmm. I, I don't remember. Did we talk about the avoidant style on how to heal that part? I know I asked about the anxious because I wanted to know about myself. <laughs> interestingly, it's interestingly, it's more or less the same fix of okay. learning to open up to other people and receive that love and care and get their nurturing and have them say, yes, I will meet your needs. Yes, you can meet my needs. Yes, we can be open and transparent because an avoidant person will say, I never imagined someone would actually accept me like this because I thought they were too selfish. And an anxious person will say, I never thought someone would accept me like this because I thought I was too worthless. This is why when an anxious and avoidant person, if they um, if they learn, I, I have my attachment boot camp video course and couples take this all the time. One is anxious, one is avoidant. They go through my boot camp course and they learn. And the, the anxious person is saying, oh, thank goodness. I am not the worthless one. I thought I was. Then they're, they're relieved to hear that there's a possible alternative. The avoidant person fights it though. And they're like, no, nah, this, this doesn't sound right. This sounds like too, too much fairy dust. Like, really? You think I can just trust people? Eh, the world doesn't quite work this way. But they slowly come into it and say, okay, wait a minute. This is pretty consistent. Maybe it, there is something here with the attachment. And as they learn about the attachment and bond together, they have the anxious person discussion with each other. They share their needs. They do all of that bonding together. And as they follow the same steps, they actually work with each other of, I thought I was worthless, but I actually am okay. And I love you. And I thought everyone else was selfish and would never love me, but you actually really do love me. And they bond together and heal each other like that. That's how that magic happens. Anxious and avoidant are either heaven or hell. As you fix it, it's heaven. If you don't fix it, it is hell. For both. Wow. wow. Yeah, definitely. So if, if any of our listeners are interested in that book, that boot camp, how can they find it? Oh, yeah. So everything I have is on adamlanesmith.com. And Lane is L-A-N-E, like the road. adamlanesmith.com. Um, I've got courses on there. My attachment boot camp's on there with the 10 steps to fix attachment. I've got multiple books on there. I have an attachment styles guide, the four attachment styles guide on there as well as all my coaching. I can work with you one-on-one. -on -one. Ah, and I forgot, I have a private community. I can't believe I forgot that. It's my favorite part of my job. <laughs> I have my, my private community where people pop in and they work with me and dozens and dozens of other people who are fixing their attachment and working on it together in a, in a crew there. We have group events. Anyone at any budget level can fix this. You don't have to be a millionaire to fix your attachment. There's coaching, there's books, there's everything. So please, by all means, even just email me and ask me, Adam, what should I do next? And I will tell you. Mm. Um, well, thank you so much, Adam, for coming on here. I know you had so much great information. I mean, I got like four pages <laughs> that I was trying oh, to good. keep up with, you know what I mean? But uh, thank you so much for sharing your information. Uh, I know that it's going to provide tremendous amount of, uh, you know, just answers and, and 
help for help so many for people. so many families out there exactly well, thank you i love that and that's thank you for having me that's why I, that's why i do tiktok for example you found me on there i'm at attachment bro i do that because tiktok needs to be a better place and mm -hmm. we need to be teaching the younger generations about this because it's getting worse instead of better and no. we together through this episode and through all the work and you guys now teaching other people about attachment as you find out and say, hey, I told, I met this guy. He can help you or whatever it is you're going to teach people as you go out into the world. We all can make it better by working on our attachment and helping other people with their attachment. That's the game. That's exactly mm -hmm. it. Great. And do you have any other social media platforms like Instagram, oh, Facebook? Anything I'm on like I'm on all of them. So I'm okay. on so on, on Instagram. I'm at attachment Adam. Uh, TikTok at attachment bro, Twitter, the Brometheus, Facebook, Adam Lane Smith, uh, YouTube. I'm on YouTube with at, 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 at Adam Lane Smith. I got 250 videos on there now teaching wow. people how to fix their attachments. So this is my passion. This is all that I do is teach attachment now. So great. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much, brother. And we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you guys.